Imagine you are on death row, waiting for the final moment of your life. You know the exact date and time of your execution, and you have no hope of escaping or being pardoned. How would you spend your last 24 hours? What would you eat, say, do, or feel? This is the reality for many prisoners who face the ultimate punishment for their crimes. In this video, we will explore what the last 24 hours of a death row prisoner look like and how they cope with their final day on Earth. Aileen Warnos Aileen Warnos was born in 1956 and had a troubled upbringing. Her underage mother abandoned her, and she lived with her grandparents. By the age of 11, she was already selling her body for drugs, food, and cigarettes, paving the way for a life of prostitution. Her criminal record started early, with several arrests for various offenses, including robberies. Between the ages of 14 and 22, Warnos faced numerous challenges and even attempted suicide six times. Her life took a strange turn when she developed a thirst for blood when working as a prostitute. Between 1989 and 1990, she murdered seven men between the ages of 40 and 65. Warnos was eventually arrested in Florida and charged with the murder of six men. During her trial, she claimed self-defense, stating that the murders occurred as she was being sexually assaulted. However, she was not acquitted, and the prosecution argued that the murders were motivated by financial gain. Warnos spent 12 years on death row, filled with ups and downs. She became frustrated with the long wait and wrote to the Supreme Court, stating that she was guilty and killed those seven guys because she hated men. She made unusual claims about her living conditions, including accusations of adding saliva, urine, and dirt to her food by prison matrons. In the weeks before her execution, she granted interviews expressing her torment and frustration with how the media portrayed her as a monster. On October 9, 2002, Aileen Warnos was executed by lethal injection. Her last meal request was a simple cup of coffee. Her final words were confusing. Yes, I would just like to say I'm sailing with the rock, and I'll be back like Independence Day with Jesus June 6, like the movie Big Mothership, and all I'll be back. Following her execution, her ashes were given to her childhood friend, Born Botkins, who scattered them beneath a tree in Michigan. David Mason David Mason was born on December 2, 1956. He was greatly bullied as a child, and he attempted to kill himself by age five. He briefly joined the Marine Corps, but was soon fed up with the process and left. In adulthood, his criminal journey began with petty crimes like stealing and prostitution. However, he eventually escalated to terrifying the city of Oakland, California, between March and December 1980. During this period, he committed a series of horrifying acts, killing at least four elderly people in their own homes. In January 1981, Mason was involved in a dramatic car chase with the police, but managed to escape, leaving the vehicle behind. Law enforcement used the information from the abandoned car to locate his house, where they spoke to Mason's mother and brother. They discovered a chilling video cassette made by Mason himself. In this video, he confessed to all of his crimes in gruesome detail, leaving it with his family in case something happened to him. Based on these confessions, a warrant was issued for Mason's arrest. On February 4, 1981, the police found him at the Holiday Inn where he was staying. He offered no resistance and was taken into custody without incident. Mason openly admitted to all his crimes during his arrest, but shockingly added another murder to the list, confessing to killing his lover, Robert, during an argument in which Robert admitted intentionally infecting Mason with herpes. Mason's trial in 1983 began with a not guilty plea, but he was ultimately found guilty of the five murders in January 1984. He was sentenced to death and transferred to San Quentin State Prison, where he remained on death row. During his time on death row, Mason fell in love with a woman named Charlene and married her. As time passed, he opened up about his guilt, admitted all his crimes, and expressed profound remorse for the evil he had committed. In an unexpected move, Mason voluntarily withdrew an appeal that could have granted him a new trial. In the weeks leading up to his execution, Mason granted interviews, speaking about his time on death row, his understanding of the pain he had caused his victims' families, and his readiness to take responsibility for his actions. Although he received over 200 letters from people begging him to reconsider the appeal, Mason's decision was final. On his last day, Mason chose to spend time with his family and asked for the same food given to prisoners as his last meal. He requested unlimited access to the telephone, declined to speak to a priest, and asked for a glass of ice water. Mason's execution took place in the gas chamber on August 24, 1993. When asked if he had any last words, 
parents. He told the warden he had none. Robert Alton Harris Robert Alton Harris was born on January 15, 1953. He led a troubled life marked by criminality and abuse. Run-ins with the law began at a young age, with his first experience in juvenile detention at 13 for stealing a car. By 14, his mother had abandoned him, leaving him to fend for himself. After a turbulent journey through the juvenile detention system and prison, Harris eventually married and had a son. In 1975, he was imprisoned for manslaughter and was paroled in January 1978. However, the darkest chapter of his life unfolded in July 1978. Teaming up with his younger brother, Daniel, the two embarked on a crime spree that led to the abduction and murder of two 16-year-old boys, John Majeski and Michael Baker. The heinous act was part of their plan to rob a bank. Harris's crimes included auto theft, kidnapping, murder, burglary, and bank robbery. The Harris brothers were arrested less than an hour after the bank robbery, and it was only then that one of the arresting officers, Steve Baker, realized that his own son, Michael Baker, was one of the victims. Robert Harris was sentenced to death on March 6, 1979, after being convicted of two counts of first-degree murder with special circumstances, along with additional charges. Harris's journey to execution was marked by numerous appeals, including one for clemency, which was ultimately rejected. His execution date was set for April 21, 1992, and it took place in the gas chamber at San Quentin State Prison, making it the first execution in California in 25 years. His final meal consisted of Kentucky Fried Chicken, Domino's Pizzas, Jelly Beans, beans, Pepsi, and cigarettes. In his last moments, Harris left a memorable statement, quoting, You can be a king or a street sweeper, but everybody dances with the Grim Reaper. This phrase was inspired by the 1991 film Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy was born on November 24, 1946. He is infamous for his gruesome reign of terror as a serial killer and rapist, making him one of the most notorious criminals of the 20th century. Between 1974 and 1978, Bundy embarked on a horrifying rampage, leaving a trail of sexually assaulted and murdered women in his wake across multiple states, including Washington, Oregon, Colorado, Utah, and Florida. In 1979 and 1980, Bundy faced two trials where he acted as his own defense, having briefly attended law school. Despite his calm and confident demeanor during cross-examination, the overwhelming evidence against him led to his conviction. By the end of 1979, he received two death sentences. However, Bundy's journey was far from over. In 1980, he faced yet another trial, this time for the murder of 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, his last known victim in Florida. He was sentenced to death by electrocution for the third time. Bundy spent nearly a decade on death row at the Florida State Prison also known as Stark Prison. During this period, he made several appeals in a futile attempt to escape his fate. While still pursuing his legal appeals, Bundy began to grant interviews, shedding light on his crimes and thought processes. He confessed to the murders of around 30 women, although some believe he may have been responsible for the deaths of even more. In chilling detail, he described revisiting the sites where he had committed these heinous acts and engaging in necrophilia. When his execution date was set for July 2, 1986, Bundy decided it was time to provide a full confession. He admitted to detectives that he had killed approximately 30 women. He also revealed that he had severed some of his victims' heads with a hacksaw, taking them home as gruesome trophies. Bundy's execution date was ultimately scheduled for January 24, 1989. For his last meal, he made no special requests and was served the regular prison food of steak, eggs, hash browns, and toast. However, he couldn't bring himself to eat. As Bundy's final hours approached, hundreds of people gathered outside the prison, eagerly anticipating his execution. Inside, Bundy came to terms with his fate and made two last phone calls to his mother to bid farewell. His last words, spoken as he faced the electric chair, were, I'd like to give my love to my family and friends. On that fateful day at 7.16 a.m., Bundy was executed by electrocution with 42 witnesses present. As soon as his death was confirmed, the crowd outside the prison erupted in cheers, setting off fireworks and dancing in celebration. His body was cremated as per his request, and his ashes were scattered in Washington's Cascade Mountains, the same place where he had disposed of the bodies of some of his victims. James French James Donald French was born around 1936. His criminal journey began while serving a life sentence in the Oklahoma State Penitentiary in McAllister for the 1958 murder of Frank Boone, a West Virginia motorist who had given him a ride while he was hitchhiking. Strangely, French had actually requested a death sentence for this crime, but the jury sentenced him to life against his wishes. Disheartened, 
French sought a new trial in hopes of receiving a death sentence, but his pleas to the governor went unanswered. In prison, French's life took a darker turn when he became cellmates with Eddie Lee Shelton. Their relationship deteriorated, and on October 27, 1961, French decided to take matters into his own hands. He treated Shelton to a last meal, a steak sandwich, and later strangled him to death. Uniquely, French fully understood the consequences of his actions and immediately confessed, explaining that he had killed Shelton because he deemed him stupid and wanted the state to execute him. During his trial, French requested the death penalty and insisted on forgoing all future appeals. The judge granted his request, sentencing him to death. French went through a series of trials, all marked by his voluntary and eager confessions to Shelton's murder, yet each trial concluded with a death sentence. During his time on death row, psychological tests revealed that French was of above-average intelligence and had a history of suicidal tendencies. He had even written a book on crime compulsion. On August 10, 1966, at 10 p.m., French walked calmly into the execution chamber. When asked if he had any last words, French quipped, How's this for your headline? French fries. Barbara Graham. Barbara Graham was born on June 26, 1923. By the time she was 22, she was already involved in a life of crime, working as a prostitute and getting entangled in the world of gambling and illegal drugs. She formed connections with known criminals and hardened ex-convicts, immersing herself in the criminal underworld. In 1953, Barbara married Henry Graham, a bartender tender with a criminal history and a drug addiction. Her marriage to Henry introduced her to his criminal associates, including Jack Santo and Emmett Perkins, setting the stage for her involvement in serious criminal activities. Barbara's close relationship with Santo and Perkins led to her participation in crime. The trio, along with two other accomplices, planned to rob an elderly woman rumored to possess a substantial sum of money and valuable jewelry. During the violent home invasion, they assaulted the elderly woman, leaving her severely injured. Although they failed to find the expected riches, they committed a grave offense that quickly led the police to their doorstep. Throughout her trial, Barbara Graham maintained her innocence, but the weight of evidence, including witness testimonies and physical proof, resulted in her conviction. Public opinion labeled her bloody babs due to the brutality of the crime and her apparent lack of remorse. In 1955, Barbara, Santo, and Perkins were found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. Despite her efforts to appeal her case, Barbara's execution date was set for June 3, 1955. As her execution neared, Barbara was transferred to San Quentin State Prison. She spent her final hours in an uneasy state, pacing back and forth in her small holding cell. The prison's warden recognized her fear and made efforts to comfort her before her execution. On the morning of July 3rd, Barbara had a final breakfast of a hot fudge sundae. Her execution execution by gas chamber was initially scheduled for 10 a.m., but was delayed until 11.30 a.m. When led to the gas chamber, Barbara requested to be blindfolded to avoid seeing the faces of onlookers. Her last words were, good people are always so sure they're right. Her execution was witnessed by 30 individuals, including reporters and corrections officers. Henry Graham, her husband, claimed her body, which was laid to rest in Mount Olivet Cemetery in San Rafael, California. Wesley Allen Dodd. Wesley Allen Dodd was born on July 3, 1961, in Toppenish, Washington. His father was emotionally and physically abusive, and Dodd often felt neglected in favor of his younger siblings. He was exposed to violent fights between his parents and never heard the words, I love you. At the age of nine, Dodd realized he was sexually attracted to other boys. His life took a dark turn as he progressed from exposing himself to children to child molestation. Despite several encounters with the law, including arrests for indecent exposure and attempted abductions, Dodd repeatedly received lenient punishments. In 1989, he took a more sinister path. Dodd sexually assaulted and murdered three young boys in Vancouver, Washington. The first victims were the Near brothers, Cole and William, aged 11 and 10. After forcing them to undress, he tied them to a tree, performed sexual acts, and then brutally stabbed them. Dodd documented his crimes in a chilling diary, which later served as crucial evidence in his prosecution. His violent fantasies escalated leading to the murder of four-year-old Lee Aselli. After sexually abusing Lee, he strangled the young boy, photographed his lifeless body, and discarded it near Vancouver Lake. Dodd's reign of terror was finally stopped when he attempted to abduct six-year-old James Kirk too, but vigilant theater employees thwarted his plan, leading to his arrest. During his trial, Dodd pleaded guilty and was sentenced to death. He refused to appeal his sentence, expressing a desire to be executed. He insisted that he couldn't control his urges and posed a continued danger to society. On January 5, 1993, Dodd was executed by hanging 
hanging at Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla. It marked the first legal hanging in the United States since 1965. His last words were, I was once asked if there was any way sex offenders could be stopped. I said, no, I was wrong. I found hope and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. After his death, Dodd was cremated and his ashes were given to his family, Gary Gilmore. Gary Gilmore was born in 1940 and was deeply entangled in a life of crime. He was first arrested at the young age of 14 in 1964 and subsequently sentenced to 15 years in prison for assault and armed robbery. However, he was released on parole in April 1976 and moved to Provo, Utah with his cousin. Despite attempting legitimate jobs, he quickly reverted to his violent tendencies, including theft and drinking. In July 1976, just months after his parole, Gilmore escalated from a common criminal to a murderer. He walked into a gas station in Orem, Utah, where he robbed the establishment and fatally shot Max Jensen, an employee. The following day, Gilmore robbed a motel in Provo and killed the motel's manager, Ben Bushnell. But Gilmore's spree took an unexpected turn when he accidentally shot himself while trying to hide the murder weapon. His cousin Brenda, who aided him with bandages and painkillers, ultimately informed the police, leading to his arrest. During his trial, which lasted only two days in October 1976, Gilmore was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. What shocked many was Gilmore's unusual response to the death sentence. He fully accepted his fate and made no effort to appeal the capital punishment imposed on him. Gilmore's willingness to die was apparent, as he went on a hunger strike to protest execution delays and even wrote a letter to his mother, asking her to stop appealing on his behalf. He attempted suicide twice but was prevented from carrying out his attempts. Facing the death penalty in Utah, Gilmore had a choice between hanging and a firing squad. He opted for the latter, believing hanging could go wrong. On the morning of his execution in January 1977, he was strapped to a chair in the execution chamber. When asked if he had any last words, he simply said, let's do it. Gilmore donated his organs in the event of his death. After his execution, his corneas were removed and sent to the University of Utah Medical Center, where they benefited two individuals in need. On death row, inmates' behaviors in their final hours vary widely. Some continue to resist their fate, while others find peace and acceptance. If you found this video intriguing, click the link on your screen to explore other amazing videos.